It's my incredible delight to call on Reverend Dr. Martin Junga, General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, to address the convention. Martin comes to us from Chile and served as the president of his church for a period of time. He also served on LWF staff in the uh, Department of De uh, Mission Development before he was elected General Secretary in 2017. Oh, 10, I was there, I remember, 2010. He was reappointed prior to 2017. We're delighted you're with us here, Martin. We know that you are a friend. You have many gifts that you have shared very generously with us and with the whole communion of churches. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Respected National Bishop Susan Johnson, bishops, members of the National Council, delegates to the Convention of the ELCIC, dear sisters, dear brothers in Christ. It is with a heart filled of joy and gratitude that I join you during these days as you come together in your convention. As a way to encourage his disciples and followers, our Lord Jesus Christ promised that when two or three were gathered in his name, he would be in their midst. He offered this word as a reminder that faith is in its essence profoundly dialogical. Faith can't go without worshiping and can't go without talking and listening to each other. The transforming presence of the triune God unfolds its full power where people gather and walk in Christ's name. And this is what you are doing in this convention, and this is what we are doing as a global family of Lutheran churches, the global communion of churches. I bring greetings from the president of the Lutheran World Federation, Archbishop Musa Pantifilibus, as well as, as, well as on behalf of the global communion of 148 churches of the LWF in 99 countries in the world, and it's over 75 million members of which you are a part of. United in worship, sharing the gospel and the sacraments, we stand together with you today to express these deep, deep bonds of unity as you come together as a national church. We in the LWF are deeply grateful for the ELCIC's active and ongoing meaningful participation in the life of the Lutheran World Federation. There is so much I could refer to. Your church hosted the, 11, the LWF 10th Assembly in Winnipeg in 2003. Your church has offered staff to the LWF Communion Office in Geneva. We remember names such as Walter Schultz, Art Leichnitz, Rebecca and Stephen Larson, Bob Granke, among others. The LWF is particularly indebted to your national bishop, Susan Johnson, who served as the vice president for the North American region from the year 2010 to 2017. Today, it is Bishop Larry Kochendorfer who serves in the LWF Council. We are grateful for this support. <laughs> Canadian Lutheran World Relief has been a steadfast and committed partner to the LWF, and among the many places we are working together, I should mention the Jerusalem program with its vocational training center and the Augusta Victoria Hospital on the Mount of Olives. It is also because of CLWR that Lutherans globally are able to offer this ministry of hope. Your church upholds its financial support to the LWF, be it through membership fees or through the contributions towards the endowment fund. We were really inspired by your church and their reformation challenges. 
You took up our themes, human beings not for sale, and you worked with 548 refugees. You offered 206 scholarships. And working together on creation not for sale, you planted 97,505 trees. And you offered $159,050 to the endowment fund. Sisters and brothers, I come here today to express deepest appreciation and gratitude to the ELCIC for your ongoing participation, for your commitment, and for your support to our global journey as a communion of churches. From the bottom of our heart, thank you very much. But wait. I'm speaking about the LWF with a familiarity that seems to imply that everybody would know about it. However, I know this is to be assuming too much. So I better pause a bit and spend time with a question that could well have been at the beginning of my greeting. What is the Lutheran World Federation? I have shared some information already, the numbers, to be precise. But what are numbers? What do they say? Is that one can count, what one can count, what actually counts? It is a question I have been asking myself lately when hearing about churches growing at a strong pace or about their diminishing numbers. Friends, God's mission has never been about numbers. It has instead always been about the wonderful story of liberation, transformation, and the promise of new life. A church doesn't have to be big in order to make a difference. It is by making a difference that a church is big in God's mission. So what is then the LWF beyond its numbers? This here is the first executive committee of the LWF. In today's perspective, one may say many things about this picture and the leaders it shows. Acknowledging this, I want still to point at the big difference they made when they came together in 1947, right after the Second World War. And the burning question which drew them together was about the witness they were called to offer in a world seeking to get back on track after the huge devastation, abject violence and murder, and the painful degradation of values. Who will we be, the Lutheran churches, in the midst of all of this? There were four callings they heard which continue to shape the witness and the ministry of the global communion today. Four foundational pillars on which the LWF is grounded. The first one related to the suffering of people because of war. At that time, 50 million people were either refugees or internally displaced people. And Lutheran churches understood the plight of these people to be their calling to serve. 50 million people were served after Second World War. So in a time when resources have been multiplied so much, the question why 70 million cannot be served is not a matter of resources. It's a matter of the moral resource of wanting to address that situation. What this world needs is not an investment into building higher walls. What this world needs is an investment to make the table larger. Today, with your church in Canada, and on behalf of it, the Lutheran World Federation serves more than 2.3 million refugees worldwide. 
It was one of the largest faith-based implementing partners of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And among its many partners, it has lately engaged in interface collaboration and established working relationships with Caritas. The second calling of our communion relates to cooperation among churches in mission. At that time, this calling related to the many emerging Lutheran churches worldwide and the desire to work together in support of these churches so that they could be strengthened. And no doubt, in those years, the perspective was so much and a lot about us in the North doing something for those in the South. One of the crossroads at which we stand today as a global communion of churches is to go beyond this one-directional perspective. Things have changed. Our largest member church today is in Ethiopia, the second largest in Tanzania. Churches struggling with their viability and sustainability can be found today both in the south and in the north. And our communion needs to grow into a new reality in which each church will always and at all times understand itself as one being both at the giving and at the receiving end at the same time, learning from each other, adding value to each other. The LWF's first African president, Bishop Josiah Kibira, formulated this vision of mutuality and solidarity in beautiful words. There is no church so big and so rich that it wouldn't depend on the gifts of others. There is no church so small and so poor it wouldn't be able to enrich others. I come with the invitation to the ELCIC to live and to continue living into this relationship of mutuality and solidarity. The third calling that brought LWF member churches together at the time of its foundation was the need to do joint theological work. Churches realized how theology had been used to promote discrimination and to whitewash violence and oppression. They understood <coughs> how contextuality, which is always a must for a church, entails the risk of getting lost in context without discerning anymore the countercultural edge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A church on its own is a church at risk, I often say. And this is particularly true as it relates to its theology. This is why we have been working together to understand theological matters in the communion. The fourth pillar is about unity. Because indeed, unity among churches matters. Never was our communion understood as a counter-proposal to the conciliar ecumenical movement, but to the contrary, as a strong element of it. Never has the formation of our communion been understood as a way to retrieving into the safe space of our confessional identity. We know that such retrieval has always eventually suffocated churches. To be Lutheran is to be ecumenical. Our communion's ecumenical journey substantiates this statement, I would say. Joint declaration on the doctrine of justification in the year 1999, the Mennonite action in the year 2010, from conflict to communion in 2014, the joint commemoration of the Reformation in 2016, where you see the picture, and the JDDJ owned by Anglicans, Catholics, Lutherans, and Methodists, and Reformed at the same time. By the grace of God, we are not there anymore, where we stood only a few decades ago. We continue to move from conflict to communion. However, we are not there either where we should be, 
sharing the gifts of God at a table that is never ours, but God's alone. I invite you to continue supporting our joint ecumenical journey. This too is a way of journeying together for the sake of reconciliation. Service, mission, theology, and unity. Those are the pillars still shaping our joint journey as a communion of churches today. Yet other commitments have come into being since then. Other insights have deepened and enriched our journey as a communion of churches, and I want to mention two of them <coughs> before coming to an end with my presentation. Women's ordination. Although not yet fully sharing this reality, today 83% of LWF member churches do ordain women. And we do share the vision of moving together respectfully yet with determination towards the goal of the ordination of women in the ministry of the church. Our commitment towards women's ordination is particularly important as we prepare for our dialogues, ecumenical dialogues, particularly also with the Roman Catholic Church, where the question of the ministry is one of the central topics to be addressed. Sisters and brothers, women's ordination is not up for negotiation. It is not on the table, but ordained women will indeed be at the table. This is who we are, and this is the gift we are able to share. The other commitment is about quotas. Our governance structures and our meetings, as long as called by the LWF, will always seek to safeguard at least 40% of women's participation and a 20% participation of youth. I personally look at quotas as a true blessing. Sometimes hard to achieve, they have brought conversations to our communion which we would otherwise have missed. If it was not because of youth in the LWF Council, and I recognize Jeff Booth among them, LWF would not have been thought, would not have even thought of the policy not to invest in fossil fuels. Yet because of youth, we moved towards that policy. I have been inviting LWF member churches to think about a youth quota, which for most still remains a challenge. No church should plan for its future without involving those who will inherit it, the youth present in the church today. Let me conclude my presentation with a thought that speaks strongly to me in times like the current ones, marked by a profound change that affects both the LWF member churches globally, and because of it, our global communion of churches. Amidst such times where the church is changing, there is a risk that anxiety takes over, which in turn always pushes churches, or often pushes them, to a sort of idolatry of the past, a paralyzing nostalgia about how things might have been once. Sisters and brothers, the church has a past, but it doesn't belong to the past. It belongs to the present, and it has a future, because of God. God continues making things new on this very day, nurturing and guiding people as they live their baptismal vocation in every day's life. Sisters and brothers, there is no other time to be the church for us than the current times. And therefore, there is no better time to be the church than this time. I want to leave this evening with this quote that describes our role and our calling in the midst of these good times to be the church. Tradition, so the quote, 
is the living faith of that people to which we must add our chapter while we have the gift of life. Traditionalism is the dead faith of living people who fear that if anything changes, the whole enterprise will crumble. Adding our own chapter, building upon the foundations we were given, while always relying on God's nurturing and sustaining presence through God's living word. That's what we are called to do. That's what we are up for. This is the journey into which we are called together for the sake and as a response of God's reconcilia reconciliation as we receive it in and through Jesus Christ. May God bless you abundantly. Thank you again for who you are in the LWF, for your participation, for your commitment, for your generosity, for your engagement. May God bless you as you gather in this convention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for reminding us that we are part of a bigger family, the Lutheran World Federation. Thank you for reminding us that we are a church who has gifts to share, but also gifts to receive. Thank you for the assurance of your ongoing partnership with us and with the rest of the communion. We just are blessed by your presence, and um, we ask you to take our greetings back to the staff of the communion office. Thank you. I have a gift for you. <laughs>